Today's Serial Entrepreneur Secrets Revealed episode is a special feature from The Complete Entrepreneur, hosted by Michael Gilmore every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern on Clubhouse. This special crossover session brings together the insights and energy of both podcasts, offering a unique perspective on the entrepreneurial journey. Get ready for an inspiring blend of stories and strategies to enhance your own path to success. The cost of raising call it the stress of raising money it's not just about the cost of raising money it's about the stress and the emotional aspects that go along with raising money and that's what we're talking about today on the complete entrepreneur our host is michael gilmore who comes in from australia and he has a different perspective on entrepreneurship and this show has a different perspective because this show really talks about you know what it takes to be an entrepreneur from the human side, from the, when you are really alone as an entrepreneur and you're trying to figure things out and you don't always have a lot of support and it takes more than just strategy. It takes more than just figuring out your KPIs. It also also takes a human side to it. It takes the emotional, the stress, the, um, let me tell you this, raising money for me, that was probably one of the most stressful things I, I ever did. I did, um, I did an IPO. I did uh, venture capital. I did, I did all of it. And you're putting yourself out there. You're sticking your neck out there. You're sticking your concept out there and you're pitching and I don't know about you, but I don't like rejection. I never have. Hey, Michael, welcome. Thank you. Hi, for, uh, so good. So good to be here. It, it, yeah, it, it really like, is. So we're trying to dissect your topic a little bit here. Like, it's all about raising money. And yeah. and the stress of that, it, you know, not every entrepreneur. We've got entrepreneurs in this audience, and including myself, who love running businesses, who love strategy, who love working with people. But we just, we don't like it. We're afraid of it, Michael. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's an interesting one, you know, uh, this topic. And it's one I thought would be really worth exploring. And once again, uh, as the complete entrepreneurs, it's not about the process of raising cash or how to do a better pitch and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we can't explore a few of those things. But it's more like, what is the journey the entrepreneur actually goes on? And, and this is what The Complete Entre Entrepreneur is all about, Colin, and I'm looking forward to today's topic so much. This is a show that's at 5 p.m. Um, Eastern Time every single Thursday, and it's great to have all these wonderful people in, the, in here with us. And if you think of someone who's going through this process right now, a fellow entrepreneur, then invite them into the room. I think this is going to be a, a – the next hour is going to be riveting. And if you've got something to contribute, then we'd love to hear from you. Like, what is the cost? What was it like for you to raise money? Um, uh, what was the journey you went on? What was the roller coaster you went on? We'd love to hear from you. So stick your hand up and let's have you up on stage. In the meantime, Colin, just before we get started into things, what's going on with startup.club? Like, it seems to me like we're just about at the million, the million um, uh, members, right? Yeah, we keep we keep getting closer and closer. Although we've expanded our membership on platforms like Entree and on LinkedIn and other areas, uh, the 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 fact is we have a lot of really cool speakers coming up. Uh, tomorrow's our monthly newsletter goes out, and if you want to get a copy of that, go to startup.club and sign up to the email list. And we have some very interesting speakers. Uh, tomorrow, if you have ever thought about starting an e-commerce business, we have one of the, the, um, the, I guess most prominent experts in the e-commerce space who's going to talk to us about that from two to three o'clock. At three o'clock, we're doing a master class. It's the only time you can ever see this master class free, and it's something that our team's been working on with with slides and present, you know, and powerpoints and all all week long. I've never delivered the speech before on on um, catching the AI wave, but I am so looking forward to this. If there's one area of expertise that I have in my life, it is really 
about how do you catch a wave. And we're going to break that down. And I'm using Thanks. my mentor, Jeffrey Moore, who, who, who interviewed for the book, Start, Scale, Legs, and Repeat. He was in the book, and uh, he actually helped me break it down. But I took it to another level. So we're, we're talking about Jeffrey Moore's concepts and then concepts that I've implemented over the last 25 years that are not in Crossing the Chasm or inside the tornado, which is interesting. So it's actually really building on the theory of how do you catch a wave? Yeah, that, that's uh, that's going to be an absolutely riveting session, Colin. I've got to just say something about AI, though. So I had to interrupt you there. And I've been using AI. I'm a developer, um, programmer, as well as CEO and I'm a company, all that sort of stuff. And I've been using AI continuously Help. in development. Yeah. So Sorry, I think Michael, you're dropping. Yeah, I think you're still dropping out there, Colin. So I'll, I'll fill in the gap until you get into a better better zone with your phone. But yeah, I've been using AI continuously uh, with development. And let me tell you the thing I have found is the biggest difference is that if I have a problem in programming and I put it into Google and I end up at like Stack Overflow or one of these great developer sort of websites, fantastic sites, you're going to read up a whole lot of things. Of, okay, what's the possible solution for this problem I'm working on? And the, and that pops the answer, and I've done a whole lot of reading. Uh, but let's imagine I don't get the query in Google just right. Then I've got to go ahead and sort of think, okay, how do I rephrase the question in a different way? Um, so hopefully I get a different results in the search listing. And you do that like sometimes you know, six or seven times or something like that. But what Google's doing is it's taking – your statement in isolation. Now compare it against, say, uh, AI. So the other day I was um, doing some development using AI as a tool on the side. And I said, look, I need this solution. Can you give me uh, a possible solution? I need it to solve this problem. And the AI goes, blah, 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 here, here's the answer. And I look at it and say, well, it's not quite the answer I'm after. I then go along and say something like, uh, it's, it's, I'd like it to be changed like this. I just sort of like talking and it goes, Oh, this is the, here's the answer. And I look at it and I go, yeah, thank you for doing that. Oh, can you do this as well? And so what you're seeing is it's a dialogue. It's not like a, a Google search where everything's in isolation. I found I was having a dialogue with a research assistant helping me as I went along and solved the problems and the programming problem I was working on. And to me, that was just, um, I know I've used AI before for different things, but it just click with me, Colin, that each of the the things I was doing were not in isolation. The AI knew we were having a conversation. And that was just, uh, it, it was phenomenal. So it completely changed also the way I then approached AI. I, a lot of people approach AI as if it's like a super duper Google. No, I, I didn't. I, I didn't, don't do that anymore. I, like I'm having a conversation and I'm wanting to go along and get the answers I need. Anyway, Colin, I wanted to add that in before we get started on today's topic of the cost of raising money. I'm not sure if you're back into a, a zone for your phone as yet. I think I am. I think I am. Yes, I don't know if I'm yes you are. There yet. I'll be in my house in about two minutes. I'm driving yeah. to my Tesla right now. We're driving home and... Uh, um, yeah, yeah, like I, I just let's just go back to that raising money and, and the AI thing. I mean, we can go on and on. We could derail. Oh, I time. could go on forever on that. But, but yeah. let's so talk about raising money. Let's talk about the stress of it. Let's talk about you know the, the the idea that you put yourself out there with a business plan and people might reject you. And if you've been in, if you're in the audience, come on, like come on stage, join us, and and really let's talk about this. Because I actually think that you can identify that you're going to be stressed out about this. You're going to be nervous. It's probably, in my life, one of the most nerve-wracking things I've done. But I've raised tens of millions of dollars for companies. And I've done it uh, despite my nervousness. <laughs> Is that the best way to put it? But what do you, what, what do we, what do you think about this, Michael? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I've raised millions of dollars of venture capital, and um, 
after the last time I did that, I, I said I would never do it again. Um, and that was just my my approach um, to it. I I, the, I found it was quite a traumatic experience. Um, and when I look back on it in hindsight, I'm much older now. I look back on it and I can sort of say, okay, the one of the fundamental things that I needed to appreciate is the say the person you're trying to get money from as such is not re necessarily rejecting you as a person. They're rejecting the business plan. And that, that they're saying it's not for them. Um, and sometimes it depends on your own attitudes and everything like that. They may reject you as a person and they may be very blunt about that, that you're uninvestable because some people are uninvestable. And Colin, and that that it's, and if you get told you're un, un, uninvestable, you need to really think about um, how you, how you're not just doing the pitch and everything like that, but what is it that makes you uninvestable, and that's a huge amount of introspection stuff. But I want to push it back one step, Colin, is that I find businesses typically when they're raising cash, they're in one of three modes. Uh, the first mode is I'm just launching. I think I need to get some cash, uh, raise some cash so that I can take the first step in this great long journey. And you're, you're going to the angel investors and all that sort of stuff, and they'll extract their pound of flesh, or you'll go to friends and family and things like that, uh, or whatever. So that's the first the first stage. So it's like there's a lot of excitement and that sort of thing because you're going to raise cash. And one of the first things a lot of those, um, particularly early investors, will do, because they're normally normally they're not sophisticated investors, like say friends and family and stuff, is they'll want to know things like how much are you actually paying yourself and try to minimize that and all all that sort of thing. So like keep you really hungry, and that can be like quite intimidating, Colin, because they're invading your private space. Like if I went up to you, Say Carmen right here. Say Carmen. So how much do you earn? How much do you? Earn? I want to know. And the Saba uh, in the audience here, tell me. I'd like you to explain to me exactly how much you earn and why you earn that much or something. That's really personal stuff. And so you, you're sitting down there with friends and family and everything like that, and they can see exactly how much you earn. You're putting a business plan in front. You've got a cash flow and everything like that, and you're suddenly very vulnerable. And it, it could be nerve wracking. So that's the early stage. I think the second second stage is you've got some traction and you're wanting to expand for growth. And uh, so you've got a proof of concept and all that sort of stuff. And now you're probably going to go to the more sophisticated event, uh, um, investor who is going to tip in a more substantial amount of money. And you're going to be suddenly encountering things you have no idea about, such as, Oh, we need to rewrite the shareholders' agreement, or um, we need to go along and uh, put put all sorts of things like belts and braces around the 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 contractual side, uh, and what they're trying to do is minimize their risk and all that sort of stuff. And so, it, it, once again, that is becomes very intimidating, and you then have your lawyer say, um, "I'm not your lawyer." I am the company's lawyer. And you sort of think, well, isn't that the same thing? No, it's not. It actually isn't. They're, they're trying to work on behalf of the company. So then I think the third stage, Colin, that we can begin to explore is, is that, that horrible stage when your company's running out of cash and you've got to raise money quickly. That, to me, is probably the most terrifying thing and companies can be thrown into those positions um not because of anything bad they've done it could be like economic circumstances um it could, could be the interest rates on these skyrockets uh, it could be a whole variety of things suddenly a large customer defaults on you and you're still going to pay the wages uh, there could be a whole lot of reasons why that occurs, but you've now got to go and prostitute yourself before some sort of investors. And you really, I, I was in this position one time uh, about 25 years ago, and I felt like I was prostituting myself, Colin, and um, in trying to raise cash in those circumstances, I would never do it again. 
uh, it was it was soul destroying. It really was. Um, uh, that left a scar on me. Uh, that period of my life. Um, and so I think there's those three areas anyway of cash raising, and they all have different personal and emotional quotation marks traumas associated with them. Um, I'm not sure if you can see him anymore, Colin. I'm, I think there's a myriad, but if I put them in three big buckets, um, they're uh, that's what that's really what the, what they are to me anyway. But they all leave you in different emotional states that's for sure as an entrepreneur what do you think Colin? michael i am with you uh right now um yes look it, it, it is it is emotionally very straining uh let's start let's start unpacking a few of the things that you talked about yeah uh, first is a lot of stress comes from pitching because uh, to the wrong people, we need to learn how to pitch to the right people. Okay, let's go back. Two thousand six. Did my IPO. I was an S one. We went public on the Toronto Stock Exchange, even though we had to do an S one in the U.S. because we we're a Delaware corporation, and uh, uh, we went under the t ticker symbol H, which was pretty cool. Was a single letter. I sort of like that. Uh, we pitched RBC, TD were our uh, underwriters. And there's a third underwriter. I can't remember the, the name now. Haywood, Haywood Scares. Anyway, so we had three underwriters. RBC was the main. And we pitched to, a, I think, 20. So give me a second here. I'm getting the numbers straight. We had 38 pitches. We did like 32 pitches in Canada. Uh, six cities throughout Canada, very conservative environments, uh, maybe a little bit similar to Australia, a lot of uh, oil and gas, a lot of that. There, there, there are a lot of the people we pitched to were um, like in many different businesses. And then we went down to the U.S. We went to Boston, New York, Chicago, um, and we pitched to six institutions in those cities. And guess what our close ratio was, Michael? We closed. What was it? We closed six institutions for the IPO, and three of them were in Canada. So it was like a ten percent close ratio in Canada, and three of them were in the United States, a fifty percent close ratio. And what that taught me was that if you're pitching to the wrong group, the wrong people, the if 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 then and then you're getting that rejection, it's really you made the mistake of just going in. And identifying a potential investor, you can't just. All investors are not equal. All investors are different. The vast majority of investors uh, really hate to lose money. Okay, let's just start with that premise. But a lot of investors who begin to focus on particular areas, like in our particular case, it was um, a software as a service, uh, creative revenue model which by the way, today is like the number one model to be invested in. Uh, but that being said, back then it wasn't as popular. And so when you are trying to pitch to, I don't care who it is, if they don't feel comfortable with the model or they're not comfortable with, they're just, it's not the space they live in, it's gonna be a very hard pitch. But if it is the space they live in, it's gonna be a very easy pitch. And so that's sort of the first lesson I learned about pitching was simply get the right Rolodex. Make sure you're pitching to the right people. We talk about a lot about that in the book, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat. Just so you know, we go into a lot of detail about raising money. And, uh, and that was probably one of the first lessons I learned. There's three or four other ones behind that. But uh, I'd, I'd love if you're in the audience, you want to come on stage and talk about your your horror story of raising money or your or how you actually get you actually raised money and it turned out pretty good and i've got some pretty cool stories to tell carmen's coming on stage now but i'll yep. add her up there yeah yeah colin um i think the the 
the question I'm going to ask you is, did you have like a merchant bank coordinate all these meetings and things like that? Like in the case when I was raising cash, I had a merchant bank, um, investment bank, sorry, uh, merchant bank, investment bank who coordinated um, a lot of the investment meetings and things um, and where, where I would do pitches and so forth. Um, and in the end, we had a multinational corporation invest in my company at the time. Uh, but that's a, that's a longer story. But yeah, so they coordinate the meetings. So when you're saying get the right Rolodex and things like that, um, is that more advising your investment bank bankers who coordinate the, all, all the pitch, pitch sessions? Um, is that really um, working more closely with them? Sorry, okay. I mean, like, it's, it's universal. I mean, yeah, it was RBC and it was pretty high end. Yeah. They messed up by pitching us, putting us into too many situations with our, my dogs in the background here. Sorry. Um, but they, they messed up by putting us into too many meetings. I mean, they're pretty RBC, TD, you know, those big companies. Yep. Stop yep. because they put us into too many meetings where, with, where investors weren't interested in what we were trying to pitch. And then they brought us into the United States and they were interested. So it was like, it was a very different, it was just very eye opening to see that you really need to pitch your concept to the right people. If you're an e commerce vendor, pitch to e commerce investors. You know, we brought Paw.com into Venture Atlanta three years ago and we got slaughtered. It was because they all they didn't care about e commerce, they wanted accretive revenue models. Um, so that's just the first, the very, very first lesson is let's make certain we're pitching to the right people, okay? That's number one. And there's more lessons from that, but I know we got Carmen on the stage as well. So Michael, I'll let you handle it. Yeah, not a problem, yes. Look, it is, it is getting in front of the right people is absolutely critical. And sometimes it's working with your investment bankers like that, in your case it was IBC, to make sure you are actually doing the right pitches. Because let me tell you, doing a pitch takes a huge amount of effort um, and emotional energy and trauma in some cases is doing those pitches. So it, it takes your eye off the operational side of the company. Yeah, so um, it's, uh, it is quite a drain uh, doing that. But Carmen, it's great to have you here up on stage, Carmen. It's fantastic. And by the way, Carmen, I actually don't want to know how much you earn. <laughs> Hi, Colin. Hi, Michael. Um, so I'll share real fast a little bit of our experience. Of course, we are very much a more an early stage startup. Uh, we are a marketplace and 100 percent all the things that you guys are saying apply. Now, um, we raised the family and friend round. We raised 170 from family and friends. And then we you know, did a lot of the steps to create our MVP um, and get our trademark. Uh, of course, become a corporation and all of those things. And then we go on to the angel brown. Um, that has been uh, frustrating because, again, what you're saying, you have to pitch to the right people. But at the same time, I look at it like a practice, right? Even if it's the wrong person, still an opportunity to talk about my company and answer questions. So, you, you know, you can look at it in a positive way, but you don't want to do that too much because it is draining. But at the same time, you start meeting people in the in the space, in the startup space. And in mo I am in San Diego, but in most cities, it's a small community and people tend to know one another and the word gets out, you know, in a positive or, or negative way. Also, the people that may not be investing in your um, space may be able to refer you to somebody who does. And then a referral is priceless, right? Uh, we know that that's, that's just a huge win. Uh, so we continue to do that. We are in the process right now. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not easy, but it's definitely worth it. it. It can happen. Don't lose faith. One of the things that I would advise is to get a platform where you can uh, organize your follow-ups. Because after you start talking to so many people, you lose them, you lose their contact information, or you forget the conversation, and then there's no follow-up. So uh, you want to you know, continue to send out reports about updates. It could be negative, it could be positive, it doesn't matter. Um, but have a platform where you can do the follow-up. And there are two or three that are very good and not that expensive. 
Um, so the follow up and then also how, uh, Colin, you were talking a lot about talking to the right people. So how do we find those people? How do we know who is investing in what? Thanks, guys. Yeah, Carmen, if I can just ask you a few questions. You said you raised $170,000 from friends yes. and family. Um, it, what was it like doing that to raise $170,000 from friends and family? Did you feel there was a big obligation towards them? Well, I look at it like this. Um, there was a time where Facebook was just an idea, right? And the people that came in early, of course, made a huge uh, profit. So I look at it like that. I believe in our product. And so I share with my family and friends so that tomorrow they can come to me and say, how come you didn't tell me about it? How come you didn't you didn't think I was good enough <laughs> to to come in with my five or ten thousand dollars? So I see it more as an opportunity to them. Of course, yes, there is a sense of responsibility to them, but that's a good thing because it keeps me, it pushes me, you know, even during the difficult times. It's like, nope, I cannot give up on them. I can't go back and say I quit. So that becomes a positive. Yeah, one of the interesting things I, I, I find in raising family and friends when I talk to different entrepreneurs is that there's an oblig there's almost like an unwritten obligation towards them. Um, that they, if, if let's imagine the company goes down, uh, you did your best, you had a go at it, it goes down and all the family and friends lose their money. Then you end up in this really awkward situation with them and and uh, the talking to other entrepreneurs they found themselves in situations where suddenly their family and friends are saying pay me back my money <laughs> um is is that something you find as a bit of a burden as an entrepreneur or is Not it like yet. very clear you've lost your yeah. money that's all there is so, to it see you later <laughs> Well, that, so that's where it's important to have a clear communication with them and let them know yeah. this is a risk. You may lose your money. Are you okay with that? And also always work with people that that is extra money to them. You know, if, if, if you know, hey, I just put it away or, you know, I got some extra money and I'll put it with you, then that's okay. But don't take money from people that are barely making their rent. That's, that's, that would not be appropriate. Um, so, so far, no, so nobody has asked for their money back. Uh, I think probably because we keep up with the reports, we send them out four times a year and we let them know the good and the bad. And so they know there's something. I think the, the problem is when you go quiet and there's complete silence and they don't know what happened, um, that could add up to that. But so far, no. Yeah, that's great. Great to hear, Carmen. Because I, I know it's, it's um, uh, some entre entrepreneurs have expressed, even on, on, on this show, that uh, it's quite uh, emotionally taxing. Like you go to the Christmas party and suddenly people are wanting to talk to you about the business. And for so I, I actually employ uh, my brother-in-law in, in one of my businesses. And um, uh, we make a point, for instance, of never talking about work at family functions and things like that. And we said that there's, there's boundaries and, and that sort of thing. And I sometimes wonder whether um, uh, when you're raising love capital, and by the way, love capital is the cheapest sort of capital you can possibly ever get. And it's quite often the best capital. When you're raising sort of love capital from friends and family and things like that, sometimes it comes with strings attached and just depending who it's from. Like some people are like, yes, it is a risk and all that sort of stuff. And others, uh, they can ex they can extract their pound of flesh. Uh, Colin, have you have you seen this sort of thing happen, or, or you've heard when you're talking to other entrepreneurs that's the case, or so, Michael, you know, or I, is it I, the I, case? Sorry, sorry, Carmen. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to add that it's very important to have a contract in place. It is yes. a goal where you are investing, so you don't get in any kind of trouble, and and the the terms are clear. So we use the safe the one put together by Y Combinator. And that's very easy. It's, it's not that complicated, especially for the early rounds. So you can go online and just find the safe uh, document and use that for your first round. Um, so yeah, make sure that it is signed. Uh, Carmen, you have just shared one of the most important pieces of wisdom out for all the entrepreneurs in this room is that when you're particularly raising from friends and family, you still have a contract. You still have a contract in place. 
and uh, and so they're signing off. It becomes more formal and more serious for them as well. Don't just take their money and put it in the bank account, but have that contract and which outlines the responsibilities and getting Y Combinator or something like that. Look, that's that's wonderful. It sounds to me like you're doing it exactly the right way there, Carmen. And keeping keeping your shareholders informed on a quarterly basis is really, really important. I, I must admit, I do exactly the same thing. I happen to do it on a monthly basis. We have a monthly cycle. So I keep my shareholders informed, um, all the financial reports, all that sort of stuff, and they can just go and get them. They can see them. And um, yeah, it's all very, it's very above board, very transparent, and it's a good way to do business. Yeah, and you want to keep that report really short, one page. Yep, yep, <laughs> very short. Doesn't have to have to be long. It's very, very short. Yeah. yeah so literally um, saying I'm still alive. And, <laughs> right? That, that's that's exactly. all they want to know. They, they, they can't they're not in the details of your business on a daily basis. So they just want to know you said hi and it's one page. Yeah, and I've also found is that the reason why they invested Carmen is because of you mm -hmm. more than the business. They believe in you, Carmen. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, yeah, it's exactly right. And so you've got to res you you got to respect that. Yeah. Yeah. So Colin, do you have to, anything? I, I'm hard to resist. <laughs> <laughs> so Colin, do you have anything to add to what Carmen was just sharing there? Yeah, I got quite a lot to add in this conversation. Uh, yeah, we talk a lot about it in the book. Um, look, my first loan from my mother was twelve thousand eight hundred dollars in nineteen ninety three. 8% interest. I paid it back and I paid it back with interest. I did not ask for an investment. I would encourage new entrepreneurs to think about uh, getting loans from the friends and family when you're first starting out. I know it's, unless unless you've got a, a, an uncle that's rich or an aunt that's rich that really is comfortable with the idea of putting money out there, but my mother was not. And uh, my father died at a young age, so we were, we were a very poor family. So the fact of the matter is I was borrowing money from her, and whether the company succeeded or not, I was going to pay back that loan. Now, fortunately, I was able to pay back that loan. And three years later, she invested $100,000 in my company, in the company that my brother and I started, and she made a lot of money from that. And several years later, she invested again uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars and she made a lot of money and she made millions. And um, that's good news. Like when, but I actually talk about this in the book, Star Scale Eggs Repeat, about when we want, I, I call it the mom test. When do we want to bring our mom into an equity investment? And well, at that point, that's when we can bring our friends and family and that's when we can really ramp it up. But if we're not willing to bring our mom into the investment, then we need to think differently about how we do the investment. And um, that mom test is really all about, we've proven our concepts, and now all we need to do is accelerate with, it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. And believe it or not, most investors would rather be investing at that stage at a much higher valuation, 10 million, 20 million, $30 million valuation, as long as they know they're investing money as an accelerant, not as a proof of concepts. Just, just follow me for a second here. The human nature is we hate to fail. We hate yeah, there are a few that really do like maybe the early, early stage, the gamble, you know, like you go to, a, go to a casino, think about the roulette table. You know, if you put your number, if you put all your money down on one number, what's your odds of winning? It's pretty low. Nobody wants to do that. So we'll play red, we'll play black, we'll play the one to 12, we'll play, we'll play different things on that table. And, and investors are, are, are similar. The nature of investors is they want to succeed. You can, if an investor succeeds two, three, four X, they're happy, right? Don't get me wrong. Venture capitalists want 10 X. I know that. Um, but the fact of the matter is if they can succeed, they're happy. If you tell an investor or some, a prospect or even a friend, friends and family and say, Hey, I have an idea. Give me a hundred thousand dollars and let me see if it works. 
it could give you a hundred times your return on investment. Yeah, it's They're not still happen. leery of that. They're still very, very leery of that. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen, Colin. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they, exactly. They're not going to invest in a situation like that. Yeah. So, I mean, that that is that. And then safe investments, Carmen, you're, you're dead on. It's probably the best structure, simple. Um, give me a second here. Safe uh, for future equity. Uh, simple. Uh, oh, my gosh. What's the acronym, Carmen? Simple. Agreement for future equity. Thank you. Yes, I got like it. That. I got exactly. it. Exactly. And they it. and they made it simple. That's right. Yeah, they made it simple. And what's good about it is there's not a lot of legals involved in putting that together. Uh, I will caution many. I've invested in in many many companies, and I don't do safe investments for early companies because basically you're saying as an investor you take all the risk. And Carmen, I'm curious for your opinion on this one. So uh, you're pitching me. Like, I'll take all the risk for a concept or an idea, but I don't even own it. I only get a, 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 a 20% discount to the uh, venture raise or the next raise, the next round. Um, and to me, that's like I take the risk, but I don't get the upside. Now, you can put a cap on that, and this is where I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs uh, who are doing using safes. To be realistic about the valuation and uh, put a reasonable cap so that, for instance, if it's 20% below the next round, but a uh, $10 million cap and you're already a valuation about $4 or $3 million, it, 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 it can be a lot more enticing because you want to sell the future. You want to sell the upside. Don't be too greedy on a race. Like, you know, you can't do that, especially if you're an early tech startup or an early company. You can't be too greedy. You've got to. Um, I love the idea of safe, but I also love the idea of a cap. Carmen, I want to hear from you and then we got to move on. Yes, I think you're correct. It's a trick. It's a trick, right? Because it's a tricky matter because sometimes they tell you uh, you want to make your com you want to make you look i'm sorry you want to make your company look like it's a big company not a tiny you know little thing so they say ask for a lot uh you know if you need 500 ask for a million if you need 200 ask for 400 so and there are other people say like you said it no be conservative and and just be real with the numbers and we i also think the have, other thing is to look at it, it, it yes yeah, right so have a discount on it's it's in, in the document so you have a discount and yeah you know what it all boils down to the idea and the team um also you want to make sure that this document is legal in your state it may not be because it was it's good in california but i don't know so just double check because you don't want to get in trouble and you know have to go to litigation and all of that but um yeah it's, it's I, think, I think common, yeah, I think common and, and Colin, it, 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 as well as like the amount of money you, you, you're raising and everything like that, is be realistic around your valuations. Um, like when you've got literally nothing but an idea and say a piece of paper, which is a business plan, and you sort of put it like, oh, it's a $20 million company, then is it really? Is it really? Like be realistic about your valuations. Um, and that's one thing I would very caution. But forgetting the mechanics of it, I think that the interesting look thing to look at, and we're going to come down to Jason in a second, thing to look at is it, there's all different ways of raising cash from investors. I and mean, there's many sessions on that. I'm very interested in exploring just the whole, um, just the emotional journey you go on as an entrepreneur. But anyway, so let's just take a, take a look at that. But first of all, I want to hear from Jason. Jason, it's so good to have you back on The Complete Entrepreneur. Welcome to the stage, Jason. Jason, if you're there, over to you. Looks like Jason has gone away for now, so we'll come to Joe. Joe. It's good to have you here on The Complete Entrepreneur. Love to hear your thoughts on the topic of the cost of raising money. Over to you, Joe. I appreciated how you guys said once you're in your startup community, you realize that everyone knows everyone. Fact, true. Feels very real to me. 
Um, the other aspect, I've been warned over and over, if you do a safe and, a, sorry, if you do a price round and a discount, um, you're almost throwing up a warning flag that you don't know what you're doing. You're either only doing a discount on a future price round or set the price. Okay, so yeah, let me try to understand this a little bit better. Let me try to understand this a little bit better. So you're saying, so now safe investments are a, you know, a future agreed, a discount to a future offering, right? You agree with that. So, so you're okay with that, right, Joe? Yeah, but at that point, I don't think the founder knows what the valuation of their company is. So this and is that's where kind of I like a, an cap. interesting yeah. aspect. That's almost yeah. like the, the team's coming faster before you could even realize what the value of your market was. Yeah. So this is where and I'm, I'm famous for doing this. Sorry. Um, when I've invested in some of these companies, uh, I actually push the, uh, the, the cap down. So, for instance, I did a, a, an accounting software uh, company a few years back, and she was raising money. And um, it was a, a pretty, very successful, pretty, pretty, pretty successful company. Uh, but it was the valuation she had on the on the cap was pretty lofty. I'm like, no, I'm not willing to do it. I pushed, I ended up pushing her down. I don't think she was too happy about it. Ended up pushing it down to like 15 million or something like that. And um, and the fact is, look, as an investor, sure, we'll put money in. We want discount to the next round that will convert that uh, debt to equity. But we also want upside. And and I'm, now I'm speaking on the other side. By the way, I really live on, on the entrepreneur side, not on the investor side, but I've been doing that. I've been doing that over the last few years. I've invested in about 20 companies. So I, I actually, like, I want all entrepreneurs to benefit and, and enjoy the, the valuations they can get from what they can do. But Greed is a problem. And, and also, when you push your valuation too high, a lot there's something called liquidation preference in, in uh, venture capital and, and other concepts. And they might actually agree with your valuation. But if you don't deliver on that valuation, it could be a problem down the road. So sometimes going too high can be a problem. Obviously, going too low. I mean, we saw Shark Tank. I mean, we see that show. All of us see the, have seen the show. A disaster it's crazy it's insanity you give 20 30 percent of your company away for what like that's just insane now there is some marketing benefit like we'll we'll give shark tank a pass right because there's a lot of marketing benefit that goes on there and that's the upside but i would never give away 20 30 40 percent of my company in the early stages think about that. that's like giving up 20 34 percent of your life that you're you're being taxed for that period of time. Now, there is alternative, and safe is a good alternative, but I just I just suggest that you do put a cap in place. So Yeah, I, I, I'd I'd agree I'd agree with the Colin. Like um it, it's it, it's it's one of those challenging things. Yeah. The other thing to look out for is ratchets. Like um uh, quite often an, an investor will say to you, if you meet this target which you have set in your business plan then um, this is my equity versus if you meet, if you don't meet the target, they'll have all sorts of ratchets up and down and all that sort of thing. And the problem I see with a lot of that is that drives the business in the wrong way is that let's imagine you have a large opportunity, uh, but it's going to take a little bit longer or something like that to attain that opportunity. Um, but it's not going to deliver results according to this fictitious one when you're raising capital then you may pass on the large opportunity because you don't want to go along by be diluted or something like that. It, there's all these weird, wonderful things that can be done. And the number one thing I always try to look for is this. Number one thing is keep your shareholding registry clean. Don't have – I'm, I'm a view, Colin. Uh, it could be different in the U.S. I'm talking from an Australian perspective. Keep your shareholding registry clean. Don't have all different classes of shares all over the place and and have all sorts of different sort of agreements which will change the share, the capital structure of the company if something happens. There's all these weird things which make it more and more impossible for you to raise capital into the future. And just bring, like I said, drives the business in the wrong way and brings incredible stress. Um, 
So what's your view, Colin, just on, you've, seen, you've probably seen this, where people make their companies uninvestable um, because of all these other different sort of yeah. considerations the investor has that's, to take into that's account. That's really a Canadian-Australian thing. I've seen that happen a lot in the stock markets with preferred yeah. shares and whatnot. In the U.S., they tend to be a little bit more common shares. Uh, yeah, you might have an exception like Google or, or Elon Musk Fa- or well, Mark Facebook. Zuckerberg. Facebook went and did it, did Mark it, didn't Zuckerberg, they? At the yeah, beginning. Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, but you, yeah. yeah, but not everyone's a Mark Zuckerberg. Let's let's, let's be realistic. But they diluted the CFO out, out of existence when he raised capital. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a different. That was a, a slightly different situation. But the but the reality <laughs> is that most of us are, are coming out there with common shares and and uh, and I, I do believe that a shareholder base. Is is very important to your success. Uh, you can actually use your shareholders to work for you for free. Let me let me go back to 2012. You remember this, Michael? Uh, we had 30 days to raise seven million dollars to participate in an auction for Dot Club. Dot Club is an alternative to Dot Com, Dot Net, Dot Org, and uh, we launched uh, the the offering. I went to, by the way, I had no broker. On this one, this this was like post my IPO years, blah blah blah. No broker went to um, my uh, thirty seven LinkedIn contacts, reached out to them, and I was very particular about who I reached out to with a, with a with a with a um, teaser. Would you like to receive the um, uh, not S one the uh, private placement memorandum, uh, the Reg D filing that we're, we're we're doing to raise money for a dot club. And we closed 26 of the 37, no broker, no liquidation preference, Carmen, and no liquidation preference. It was all direct common shares. And we were able to close that with zero revenue, just a concept. And it happened for a few reasons. One was we had a really, really well-written private placement memorandum with a law firm that we worked with. Two, it was a, it was a good story, Michael. You know the story, Dot Club. And, uh, and we had the, the uh, ability to apply for the application for that TLD. We won it, uh, and we ended up selling it nine years later to GoDaddy Registry for a huge, massive profit. So all the shareholders made, it made, out, uh, made a lot of money on that particular company. But the fact of the matter is, here I am, raising money for a business and I've no broker. I got 30 days to, to raise $7 million and we were able to pull it off. And we did it simply by doing a reg D filing in the United States with a private place mem- memorandum. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to confuse people in the audience. This is not as complicated as it sounds. And again, I know I keep pre- preaching the book uh, that, uh, that we published in October 3rd, but it really details every form of financing in the book, the right financing for the right situation. Uh, and the book starts scale, exit, repeat. Number one, 13 categories on Amazon. Very cool. Uh, but it, it really, really breaks it down. So if you really want to understand that, that was that's probably the simplest, fastest way you can understand it. It was actually a, law, a lawyer uh, who was on Clubhouse who I got to know very, very well, who also wrote a book on the same topic or similar topic, raising money for the right situation. But the fact of the matter is you can raise money without liquidation preference. Liquidation preference, let me give you another, okay, let me flip that story a bit. I'm now working with a company. Company's been in business for 15 years. The founder owns about a third of it. He's been kicked out of the company. I took over his board seat, actually. And I was came in to try to turn the company around. They raised $60 million of venture capital. Today, the company's worth maybe 10 million, maybe 15. Like the fact of the matter is, if the company were to sell today for $15 million, this founder gets zero. Uh, hang, hang on, Colin, I just need to interrupt you there. The founder raised $60 million and is now of worth venture 10 capital. Million. Yep. You've got to be kidding me. Okay. So, but here's the funny thing, Michael. What if there was no liquidation preference? What if he actually still owns, he still owns a third of the company, 
And what if they sold the company for $20 million? He still walks away with $6 million. It's not too bad after – I mean, it's not the best in the world for a startup, but, you know, it's not too bad after 15 years. But guess what he's walking with now? Zero. See, you don't know this, Michael. 70 and, – and, and Carmen, 75% of venture-backed companies fail. Just, just think about that for a second. Why? 75% of venture capital companies fail. We all think we hit the lottery when we get venture capital. Yet three quarters of the people who hit the lottery walk away with nothing. Zero. Zippo. That's the reality of the situation. Yeah, that's that's a scary stat. But I think that you're absolutely right, though, is that... Um, the other thing I found is that just the whole journey with raising capital uh, for the entrepreneur is is quite it's quite challenging. Yeah, to be sitting in a VC's office and that sort of stuff, and um, and doing a pitch to them. Just the whole you're know, normally waiting in the uh, in the lobby or something like that, whatever. And then you, you you get ushered into this room, and you got to do a pitch, and you got like uh, a, f- a few minutes, not not very long typically to do the pitch. It's um, it's probably one of the most intimidating things uh, you can actually do, and depending upon the circumstances in your company, um, there'll be all this sniff out of this blood in the water. So if your company is like really needing to raise cash. They'll, they'll know. They, they've seen a thousand of these pictures and they know straight away, okay, your company's bleeding cash. We're going to screw you for an unbelievable deal. And you you feel like in yourself, and I use the word prostituting, you're like, it's almost like, please, sir, can I have some more from your Oliver Twist? Like, oh, please, please, I just need to go along and get a little bit more cash because of this horrible situation that's befallen me. And the, and, and the VC sitting there going like, yeah, that's that's not my problem. My problem is to give a good return to my shareholders. Therefore, I, um, you're about to get screwed to the wall, if anything. <laughs> you know? And it's it's really tough on the entrepreneur. Um, it's it's a tough situation um, to to actually go through that um, and just emotionally deal with it. Um, yeah, Carmen. Yes, I'm sorry. I agree with with what you're saying. But it can also be turned around, right? We can also say, hey, Matt. Of course it can. You know, and the faith that we have and the understanding and the potential that we have about our company. So I think that if we have a really clear, especially, uh, you know, really understanding the market, really understanding what the possibilities are. And so I think that changes it, right? Um, That changes our attitude and we go in there with confidence. And, um, Uh and. Yeah, I think that helps a lot. If if the if the founder is confident, that gives confidence to the investor. Oh, hey, uh, you com- know what you're completely doing. Completely agree with you. Right. I, I co- completely agree with you, Carmen. But what happens if the founder is is, str- is really struggling because so let's imagine you didn't get a big payment because someone defaulted, and so you've got to raise cash within the next fourteen days or you don't make payroll. Some some disaster befalls you, right? Then it's it, the 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 founder can be confident, yes, but um, it, it can be really difficult emotionally. Of how do you wrestle that through, Carmen? I, I think that's a really big challenge for some some founders because the reality of business is sometimes stuff happens and it's not pleasant, and exactly. you're suddenly it, 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 you're suddenly in a position. Uh, where you never want to be. Like personally, I, I'm I'm of the view that every every business should um, should go along and uh, get to a stage where they've got a chunk of cash in the bank, so they can they're never in that position ever again, where they're forced to instantly raise cash. But that's not always possible. Exactly, that's not so, always possible. So I hear a lot that raise when you don't need it. Don't wait yes, for yes. the emergency. <laughs> says have because that also shows prudence, right? That you're you're pr- prudent yep. enough with your company where you have, um, you know, some kind of uh, reserves. So I, I, you know, they say raise when you don't need it, 
which makes almost no sense, but yet that's <laughs> that's how it's done. And I think the other thing, it goes back to relationships, right? If you have built a relationship with your early investors and you have an emergency, they have already you know, uh, invested in you, they understand the business and they can see that this is a normal, just a normal everyday way, um, a business that can happen. You lose a contract, you know, you have something that didn't go right. So then you can go back to the early investors. I think that would make yeah, more I, sense. They go right to I, a I agree. investor. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with you. In fact, uh, as Colin was saying earlier, he was saying that having, having a, um, uh, a set of good investors is so important because, you know, sometimes, particularly in the early stages of a business, things happen and you need to, may need to go back to them and sort of say, hey, this happened. We need to raise a bit more capital and that sort of stuff. And that's just the reality. And if they're reasonably sophisticated, like I know, Colin, uh, many of the ones in Dot .club were, then they'll just understand that. They will understand that. And some of them will, will then partake in another round, you know, to, to obviously propel the company forward. I want to hear, come back to Jason, come down to Jason just there. Um, Jason, uh, I'm not sure if you're there yet. You, uh, I, do you have anything to share on this topic? Looks like Jason's still away. Okay, he's probably working hard in his business like we he all is, need to be God. working hard. Yeah, exactly. Sorry? But I want to I want to unpack. Like, you guys are like killing like three or four or five different topics in like two minutes here. Oh, uh, I so many yes, they, they, every investor can sense when you're running out of money. Yeah. We don't want to do it. Yeah. Carmen, you're uh, right. We don't want to do it. On that note, I would love to offer a resource and I would love some feedback on this resource. Links in chat, but it's a five year business plan with a cap table in fusion. Okay, uh, Joe, uh, I was just jumping in with the concept of you don't want to like raise money when then they all sense blood they can smell blood all right but joe i'm, I'm curious i want to hear more from you can you restate that i haven't done the ebitda calc on it yet but i used to do the profit and loss statements for lots of money for a bit um so i created a cash flow five-year runway plan with a separate spreadsheet which is a cap table multi-dilution cap table and so if you put the month that it money injects into the company, it shows up on the five-year business plan. Or if you divest, it shows where it's taken out of the company in the five-year um, runway model. Is this a unique model of investing that you've designed? Because it sounds yes. rather unique to me. It, yes, I'm a chemical engineer and uh, money is easier than chemistry. <laughs> okay, so you're so so so. Fo let me try to follow this. So you you put money into the company, uh, so you commit to a certain amount. I presume you commit. You put money in. You gain shares. You pull money out. You get out shares. That sounds almost like a dual almost, entry calculator. Yeah, but you're going to have some SEC issues with this because you're moving you're moving stock in and out. Uh, I, I I would I, I would. I'm curious how you have you uh, thought about the SEC. Uh, I, I think it's, it's correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, Joe. This is this is not for that purpose, but it's more like a sophisticated um, uh, cash flow uh, cash flow model. Um, and so you can actually see the results going in and out across time across the next five years. Is that correct? Correct. That way you can run your uh, yeah. your yeah. runway. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, so. see, see when money gets uh, injected in for multiple round dilution. Um, yeah. Not that you're changing shares, but it could technically do that math if it needed to. Yeah, no, no, that, ma that makes perfect sense. But um, let, me, let me say, I, I sadly, I can't believe the time. I just realized it's, it's um, 58 minutes and uh, we're coming to the end of this time, which is... Um, Oh, which is which in some ways is a little bit sad, but it means we're hungry for more for next time. Um, but just as we close out, Colin, yeah, do you have any one last comment or something like that? Um, look, I mean, oh, we got Superior just jumped on stage. <laughs> Superior, and we've got like yet 60, 60 seconds only, Superior. You just jumped on stage last minute. 
any thoughts about uh, this topic that we're going on, uh, or can we close <laughs> it out here? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I think that it'll be a lot easier for um, small business entrepreneurs to raise capital once the regulatory market returns to some semblance of normalcy after we get these old, decrepit, loser liberals out of office. Yes, guys. And we close our borders, too, <laughs> because we're allowing millions of these fucks to just walk across our border. That's not helping anything either. So, yes, borrowing money as a business owner is harder than ever because, yes, we're flooding the country with illegals and we have an incompetent, sleepy, you know, little girl. So got it. Got it. Right sure, like, yeah. You know, we're trying to keep this apolitical. We're not like we start a club, not yeah. political. We understand where yeah. you're coming from. And uh, um, look, I know we got a lot of people want to come on stage right now, but we do have to close this down. Uh, it is a live yep. show. You can see that. And we do this every Thursday, 5 mm-hmm. o'clock Eastern. And this particular show is going to be syndicated in podcasts on the uh, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat network. Uh, which uh, we, uh, if you have, if you've seen it, we've got about 150 shows out there right now. Tomorrow, if you ever want to start an e-commerce business, we have the expert on tomorrow at two o'clock Eastern, and at three o'clock, uh, I am delivering the uh, uh, masterclass for free on Entree. It's an, it's a new platform called Entree, and I'm delivering it for free. It will not be free after I deliver it tomorrow. You have to have a pro membership to get it. And the topic is catching the AI wave. And our team has been working all week on putting together a presentation that we're going to deliver. And this comes right from the book, 100% from the book, Start, Scale, Exit, Repeat, which came out on October 3rd. And we interviewed Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm, Inside the Tornado, and tomorrow we're going to re- reveal what it takes to catch an AI wave and how you can win with that wave. Michael, thank you very much. It's been a great show. Oh, it's good being here. It's been good being here, Colin. And it's always wonderful having uh, Cam and Joe and also Superior here a minute. And but it's a live you're show, the audience right? there. Is show, the, right? you can never yeah, know you're the reason up. why we do this. <laughs> Exactly. You're the reason why we do this. And it's always wonderful to have you here. I'm going to jump into a meeting right now and accelerate my business. So I hope you're doing the the same. Next week, I'm actually traveling next week. So I'm not sure, Colin, what's going to be going on. I put the the, the schedule there. I pass it to to Mimi. But um, yeah, yeah, so I'm actually... we'll, we'll, We'll keep rolling. We'll keep rolling with it. Uh, absolutely. So I look forward to seeing everyone um, uh, after I finish my my ventures of traveling, being up in the air and so forth like that. And God bless you all and have fun in your own businesses. See you later.